Awesome. We're really excited to have you here. I have to say, um, of all the guests we've ever had, I think you've maybe run the largest company. How big was 1-800-DENTIST at its peak? Uh, about 45 million a year in revenue. Okay. So I think you definitely have run the largest company of anyone we've had on as a guest. So really, really, really privileged to have you here today. Can you tell us a little bit about your background and how you develop the area of expertise in boldness, which is what we're going to be talking about today? Uh, I bounced around with uh, several different jobs as I was going through college, which took me eight years. And then uh, uh, didn't have any direction, didn't have, didn't know what I wanted to do. And then mm -hmm. one day I walked into an ad agency and I said, oh, these are my people. Mm -hmm. uh, I could do this as a career. And so I, I was lucky enough to have a night school that taught advertising writing. And it was taught by working creative directors in Los Angeles. And so they really sharpened my skills and I got into the agency business as a copywriter and they would bring me into all the meetings because I knew how to talk to the business owners because I'd worked in like 40 businesses over uh -huh. the course of my life. Um, and it, that was the first time I, my boldness emerged. I became a, I was a very shy, underconfident person in most areas of my life. Uh, but when it came to advertising and my creativity I would love to pitch it. And so, and I would pitch it with enthusiasm and mm -hmm. passion. And so they were always bringing me into meetings because I would sell the creative. Okay, uh, wait, let me, put, let me put a pin in there for a second, Fred. Were you doing copywriting for direct response advertising? No, this was for, for big Brand. companies. This was, okay. this was like uh, First Arizona Bank mm -hmm. and uh, Van de Camp Seafoods, Oro Wheat Bread. Um, this, the agency had huge clients mm -hmm. beyond what I did, uh, Ericsson electronics, they had Miller beer. I mean, they, they were in the, they were a top 10 agency, mm -hmm. uh, and we were the LA office. So we were, we were getting the crumbs a lot of times, but sometimes, <laughs> you know, they brought me in at, when I left and, and started 1-800-DENTIST, they asked me to come back to pitch a new client that they were a big client that they were getting and, and just come in on the creative because I was such a fun pitch man for them. And uh -huh. they, so they hired me as a creative director that paid me. I just that was the first time I learned to just ask for a lot of money. So um, you were you had started a company and you were sort of doing this on the side. Sounds like a lot of entrepreneurs, actually. Yeah, well, because the, my business wasn't made. We needed money from everywhere. Right? So yeah. it's like, oh, yeah, here's a twenty five thousand dollar contract. Hell yeah. Let, I'll go do that. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, because we were we had we started one eight hundred dentist with thirty thousand dollars of family money. And that's we didn't take any more money for 15 years from other wow. people, yeah. uh, mostly because they wouldn't give it to us. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, that was that I did. I loved advertising as a career and as a business, but I didn't like the career arc. Mm -hmm. which is it falls off a cliff. And I was watching them. I, they would lay these guys off at, at 50 years old and, the, and they couldn't get a job. And they were making a quarter of a million dollars a year. Uh, and so I said, I can't let this happen to me. So I was looking for a business to start. And a friend of mine said, let's do this. You know, a friend of mine had the 800 Dennis phone number. And I, uh -huh. I understood from advertising that having your how they contact you being what you do being your brand was huge yes because um, i had made radio commercials and you would have to say the phone number like 20 times in in 60 seconds for them to remember it for 90 seconds people mm -hmm. remembered ours for months um and i i would say it like four times in the commercial mm -hmm. so and it was the same thing when we got to television we did primarily broadcast once we from the very beginning we went started in radio and then we went to television and that's we rode that for 20 something years gradually moving online as well and then eventually that's that d disintermediated the business google just basically crushed us that we went th th meanwhile they're taking a half a million dollars a month from us 
in in buying clicks. As an advertiser, yeah. Right, but they're saying you know that we're, we're our goal is to eliminate you and just go you know sell website clicks directly. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. I, and I think I the said, travel yeah. agencies have come to a similar conclusion. Yeah. So and people people stopped using the phone. So, mm -hmm. you know, 800 numbers became less and less meaningful. Uh, and uh, as, as they people search more and more online and TV became worthless uh, unless you're selling cars or beer or burgers, basically, or drugs. Clearly, if you watch the evening news, there's 40 things you need to be asking your doctor about immediately. Um, <laughs> but the rest of the stuff, it's it just didn't work anymore on television. So our, our two cornerstones of the business the phone number and television advertising yeah. vaporized question though you started in radio and then moved to television is that because you use radio as an opportunity to test and perfect your your message before you added the you know additional aspect of you know video right yeah and put it on television well it was two reasons one it's cheaper to produce radio sure. stuff, uh -huh. uh, a lot cheaper than producing a, a good, uh, you know, a, the production involved in television. And you get right to your audience, you get to the premium audiences, which you don't, you know, buying network television, like primetime television, which we almost never bought our whole time. Um, that's, incredibly expensive to test and it doesn't mm -hmm. usually work in any sort of direct response because that's really what we were but radio works great still still does in some in some areas if you can if you can buy it right but you we could buy you know talk radio uh and and just do great on it because uh, it because people at the time of course people listened to the radio in their cars yep. they were forced to listen to commercials yeah. um, and so we we just had them and 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 you could tell by when the phone rang what spots were working what uh -huh. stations were working um and even though there was a lag time to a lot of the response there was always these surges we learned to do tracking the data with all of these sort of algorithms that we created that said, okay, we know that they're not all calling immediately, but mm -hmm. a certain percentage are going to call within the next five to 10 minutes. And that yeah. was, gave us our tracking. And then there was all of this lag time that really worked well for us. So you just left some space in between the ads and then you were able to tell which ad was driving the traffic. Yeah. Um, and then and so you go from station to station and try them as well. So even though you weren't doing direct response advertising when you were the agency, it sounds like that's exactly what you were doing at 1-800-DENTIST. Oh, yeah. Can you it was, talk it was about all it? about making the phone ring. Yes. Yeah. So can you just, you know, for people who are listening today and don't know what direct response advertising is and how it's different from maybe the big Coca-Cola ads that we're accustomed to, see, to seeing, can you describe what direct response advertising is and why it's valuable for small companies in particular? You're trying to get an immediate response. All of these other industries that are spending money are are trying to build brand recognition. That's they'll they'll spend tons of money on Twitter. That's why Elon Musk is getting into all of this. He says the all of seventy percent of Twitter advertising spenders are brand builders. He's trying to say how many people are real people here on Twitter, uh, and, and so it's it's a fascinating sort of challenge to dump all your money out there to build your brand. Direct response is, um, is looking for a sale of some kind or a response that is like, for me, it was a, a phone call to 1-800-DENTIST was the beginning of a sale. That yep. I had to get that. My advertising was aimed 100% at getting them to call the phone number. It was not to get them to be aware of how they should take care of their teeth and all the wonderful things that you can get from a dentist. It was like, no, if you don't have a dentist, you need a dentist, I can help you find the one that's right yes. for you. Yeah, and so you're reaching people, as they say, in the bottom of the funnel who are already aware that they have a problem and are looking for a solution and boop, there you pop up right in front of them at the right moment. Yeah. And there was a there was a certain percentage of brand building because our number was so memorable. Yeah. But most direct response doesn't have that. 
it's like you got to get a buyer somebody's got to buy your stuff now they got to click look at the little video that says what it does what the offer is and buy it yep yep so it's really great for early stage businesses because you're really putting your money toward advertising that drives sales it's very focused on that action that leads to sales and it's also very measurable. So you can figure out where your where your leads are coming from and put your marketing dollars in the best possible channel. Yeah. And and the beauty of the the advertising world now is the data is so deep and wide, the yes. analytics that you can get. Um and you know, and obviously the the cornerstone of it is their website. Uh it 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 has to it has to move people towards buying uh and 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 say exactly what you do as in whatever medium they're looking at which is mostly the phone as we know uh it, you know and i'm spending time with dentists all the time helping them to understand what their why their website sucks so much because <laughs> <laughs> they've got some horrible stuff um um but you you can tell you can you can a b c d test your ads to see which ones are not just getting clicks but going all the way to a close to mm -hmm. to to an to buying because yeah. there's a the whole bunch of people out there that are happy to sell you clicks and that's that's the deal but you want to you need to be able to narrow it down to say like look ten thousand clicks and two sales is terrible right because i paid for mm -hmm. so many clicks um, but if I, you know, and let's go back to a dentist again, I could send, uh, 20,000 potential patients to my doctors, but if only 20 of them show up, they've answered the phone on their end and booked somebody who doesn't show up. Uh, and so it's actually damaging. So I had to become this interim filter to make sure it was a real patient, what we would call in lead generation, a warm lead. Mm -hmm. And so I, I love what you can do now because we didn't have it. We didn't have anywhere near that level of analytics now. But, you know, as I, pro I have a consulting business now, I can tell what everything does. How many people watched my promotional video? You know, did, it, did more people watch it on LinkedIn than they watched on Instagram or Facebook? Mm -hmm. and, and then what did that turn into? Did they click? Did they go to my website? So th this is... It's, it's a beautiful world. And then the whole idea of crazy stuff, like a lookalike audience. Yeah. We, we never had that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah that's like uh, the greatest thing ever. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's really a black box. You don't know what happens back there or how that lookalike is created, but it sounds like a great idea. Give me, let me advertise to a bunch of people who look a lot alike the people who are already my customers. Sounds brilliant. right. Because otherwise you, all you've got is your customers mm -hmm. to get to. Uh, yeah. And, and that's, they already bought from you. Mm -hmm. All right, so Fred, let's flip it a little bit. And you yes. have written this book, Super Bold, yes? Yes. Talk to me a little bit about boldness and how you define boldness, boldness and why you feel it's so important to business owners and why we're having this conversation today. Boldness is essentially uh, being able to say what you wanna say whenever you say, it uh, uh, to whomever you want, to meet whomever you want, to not hesitate and miss opportunities and, mm. and to have the confidence that you can go into action and ask for a sale, ask for money, raise money, uh, meet people in a networking environment and make a real connection with them uh, and, and just bring your full self to the world. Uh -huh. uh, that's, that's what boldness is. And that's what super boldness is, is you can bring, you have the ability to bring your full self to whatever situation it is, whether it is a meeting with three people or on stage with 2000. Yeah. You know, for the way you're describing it right now reminds me so much. I just recently rewatched that movie. You've got mail. Remember it with Meg Ryan. Yeah. Uh, old movie and it's very fun to actually go back and watch movies with old technology now but I was just watching that movie again and one of the things that she complains is she kicks herself whenever she has a conversation with you know Tom Hanks who owns that you know kind of big bookstore around the corner she has the little shop and 
She kicks herself because she's never able to say what she wants to say at that moment. And she doesn't think about it until she gets home. And then she's so angry that she didn't say it. And then when she finally develops what it sounds like you're describing as boldness, like the boldness is say, you know, to think of it quickly and, and say what she means. It turns out that she's actually quite mean. <laughs> and, then, and then she's embarrassed that she said what she said. Yeah, well, I mean, the the whole idea is you, bold people are very comfortable with failure uh -huh. and rejection. They they know it's part of life. Mm -hmm. People who are underconfident they they lapse into perfectionism because, like, mm -hmm. oh, before I walk over and talk to that person, I have to have the perfect thing to say. I have to be really clever and interesting and maybe funny and bold people don't waste any of their energy on that they yeah. just walk over and talk to the person yeah uh, perfectionism is kind of the enemy of entrepreneurship you would never get anything done no it, it <laughs> we are in the ready fire aim world <laughs> yes completely because you can't know what the marketplace wants mm -hmm. you can think you do but the marketplace will tell you and i am constantly coaching people on uh, you know, you have to launch, you have to get out there yep. and pay attention. And, and you could be pivoting 270 degrees before you're done, uh, mm -hmm. or 720, who knows, but, uh, the, the marketplace is there to inform you and you gotta be, gotta be two things. You gotta be open to criticism and feedback, mm -hmm. which takes boldness. Yeah. Right? to to invite feedback and then gradually and, and and then you have to have the boldness to to approach anyone and talk about your business uh to wear the t-shirt literally and figuratively and mm -hmm. and you know i tell people who are starting a business if if you're in starbucks by the time you get your coffee the person in front of you and the person behind you should know what you do <laughs> It's good advice. And yeah. Every time. And that just takes boldness. And that's yeah. that. But also you have to know how to do it. It's a it's it's a skill that develops and it develops by not really having agendas with people. So you're saying that we are not necessarily born bold, but it's something that we can learn over time. There are a few people that seem to be born that way. Mm -hmm. I think they just never had it inhibited out of them. <laughs> um, and because I see most kids, they'll they'll dance. You ask them if they'll oh, dance yeah. and sing. They can dance and sing. At yeah. ten, they can't dance and sing anymore. Somehow, yeah. You right? know, my my daughter called me the the other night. She just got one of those little kids' wrist phones. She's eight, and she called and she left me a message. And the message said, "Mommy, I love you. I'm tired now, so don't call me back." It was just like as matter <laughs> of fact as possible, as unapologetic as possible. I love you, but listen, I don't want to talk to you. Yeah, let's be clear about this, right? <laughs> yes. and it's, I mean, it's so great. And it's, but I mean, kids are like this. I just, you know, I, I got in the elevator the other day with a, a, a young girl. It was a, she was like five or six years old and her mom is with her and she's got a, her bike and she's got a funny little helmet on like a unicorn helmet or something. Uh -huh. so I, said, oh, I, I really like your helmet. She goes, yeah, yeah, it matches my bike. And I said, do you want to push my floor? Because kids love to push the elevator yeah. buttons, right? Yeah. So she says, oh, yeah. And I said, it's number four. So she says, oh, you're only one floor away from us. We can come up and visit. <laughs> and I thought, yep. that is, when did that change for us? Uh, and, I, and, and I thought about why did that work? Why was that so adorable? And it was because she had no agenda. It was like, mm -hmm. let's, I can, we can come up and play. Now, if I said that to you if, and when we were in the elevator, you'd assume there was some sort of agenda going on. I would lock my door when I got into my apartment, <laughs> for sure. Yeah. <laughs> but, but that's what we do when we try to network is we don't use our interest in other people as a tool. And that's mm -hmm. when it, it's so powerful to just you know, have your agenda be, I'm going to connect with this person. Maybe yeah. it's 30 seconds. Maybe I'm just going to make them feel good about themselves. Mm -hmm. You know, when you're in that Starbucks line, the bold move is not to say, by the way, I'm a real estate broker. Mm -hmm. uh, the bold move is to say, wow, those glasses look amazing on you. Mm -hmm. uh, I just wanted to let you know that. And before you know it, there's a conversation. Mm -hmm. And you don't have to pursue that. Eventually, they're going to say, so, so what do you do? 
and you say, oh, well, I, I, you know, I have this software business where you can have somebody will come and wash your car. All you have to do is push a button, uh -huh. you know, whatever the heck it is. And they go, well, how, how do I find that? But that's not how you start. You right. start by being interested in them and you're doing what I, a drive by compliment. You know, mm -hmm. that's, that's, it's amazing the power of that. And people, that's why they, you don't have to be clever. You just have to be nice. Yeah. Clever yeah. puts pressure on the other person to be clever. Uh, it's like, it, it usually dead ends the whole thing because you've come up with something really clever and they just met you and they're not <laughs> particularly clever themselves or they're just caught off guard or they are not haven't clever gotten on the their spot. coffee yeah. yet. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, but you can learn it because I learned it. I was, however shy you may be, however many opportunities you missed, I probably have more. Okay. Mm -hmm. I, but they just frustrated me and eventually made me angry. And I said, I have to figure out how to change this. And I just emulated bold people. I just constantly ventured into my discomfort and uh, until I, I, the, my comfort zone got bigger. And I also got the reward loop of being bold because mm -hmm. good stuff would happen. Mm -hmm. Because what happens with the rest of us is we we have all these mechanisms that we stop ourselves with. Bold people are never the ones who stop themselves, mm -hmm. which is huge. Yeah. Yep. Because uh, and because that's what happens. All the fun stuff, all the amazing stuff happens when you get out of your comfort zone and discover what's possible. You when know, you, I when, I often when you ask for an offer, you know, yeah. from a, in business, you know, yeah. I often think of this when I think about a friend of mine who interviewed for a job and they made him an offer and they told him the amount of money. And he said, Don, it was more money than I ever thought I would make. I said, really? What did you say? He said, well, then I asked for more. <laughs> and yeah. I just thought that would never occur to me. If somebody made an offer, it was more money than I ever thought I would make. I would say, wow, thank you. But he said, I asked for more. And I thought, that's right. That's what you right. need to do. Because even if you took, if, even if you took their offer, now they feel like they got a deal. They got a deal because they were expecting you to counter. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and that's bold. People do that when yes. they, they, and 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 all that is is saying I am worthy. That's a powerful mm -hmm. message. And and my business, my product is good. My service is good. I, I have something good to offer you. I, and we see this happen with people who are raising money for their business and they got a great pitch deck. They got a great product. They can't stand in front of people and, and present it. They don't. Mm -hmm. And, and what people do when they invest is they bet on the, the entrepreneur, not the idea. And a lot of people think, no, if I just, they're going to see, it's a really good idea. No, they don't care. They mm -hmm. care about, they, they bet on the jockey, not the, the smart horse. ones do the yeah. smart ones yeah. do. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the angel investors do it because they're being nice, you know, yeah. uh, or their family members or whatever, or, or it sounds like fun to be part of. It's why people raise money for movies. It's like, they want to be able to say they're one of the exec producers. Yeah. Uh, the rest of us just have regular businesses with no cachet associated with it. Mm -hmm. um, but that, that boldness, allows you to ask for the money, ask for, ask for what you're worth. One of my personal coach, he taught me one of the first things was never undervalue yourself. Mm -hmm. And it's so easy to do. It it's is. so easy to, to like back off even to say, that's going to be $10,000. But for you, I, you know, I'll do it for 7,500 for you. Right. You didn't wait to see if 10,000 was okay. Yeah, you just negotiated against yourself. Yeah, you just you just gave them a discount before they asked for one because mm -hmm. you didn't have the confidence to shut up. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so talk to us a little bit about how we can develop boldness. When we spoke before, you said that there are very tactical things you can do to develop this over time. Yeah, and so in my book, I, I lay out the, the systematic way. Because what I did is I compressed the decades of me doing it into yes. a way somebody could just start to build their boldness muscle right away and keep building it. And it's called the PRIDE method. And, mm -hmm. and PRIDE is an acronym. Of course uh, it is. 
Yeah. Well, and it, <laughs> but the word, yeah, the, the word is means something to me. Yeah. Why wouldn't you want to live a life that you're proud of? Yeah. And that means you left it all on the mat. You, you, you tried everything. You didn't stack the regrets up and get to the finish line and go, I wish I'd done that. Wish I'd said that. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I, I try to drive this home. It's, there's going to be moments in your life when you are going to want to speak up or need to speak up or step up. Uh, and you're not going to want to miss those. You're not going to want to say, oh, well, I, I you know, I, I, I'm not sure I want to say anything. Uh, and, and these, these windows will close on you and they will, they could be pivotal moments in your life and you will, they will gnaw at you forever. If you, when they interview people in their last weeks of their life, all they talk about is the things they didn't do and didn't say those were what they don't regret the mistakes they made, the money they lost, the failures, they regret none of that. They regret the things that they didn't try, that they didn't uh, do, that they didn't say. They didn't fix their relationship with their brother mm -hmm. after not talking to him for 20 years. They were like, I fixed it last week. That's ridiculous that, that I finally did that because we, we had a grudge neither of us could remember. Mm -hmm. But this is, so it's important to know that we're, we're in the game of life, but we don't know how long the coach is going to let us play. Right. So get to this stuff. So the pride method, the acronym is preparation, preparing for what you're going to do or say, uh, and develop those skills to do that. Mm -hmm. Relaxing, which is a life skill to understand yeah. how to physically relax yourself. And you can do it. Nobody teaches you this. Nobody taught me in high school or elementary school or college or after college. A uh, bunch of people taught me after. And it's, it's quite easy, actually. Um, it, but it's not, why don't you just relax? That's not how you do it. <laughs> that you makes you more nervous. <laughs> just touching on the preparation thing really quickly. So you can't, you obviously cannot prepare for every possible situation that that's thrown at you. But we had a guest on recently talking about public speaking. And one of the things he recommends, which this reminds me of, is just getting up every day, throwing a random topic on the table and giving a speech to yourself in front of the mirror for a few minutes on that random topic that you pull out of a hat. And just the practice of picking up a random topic and immediately speaking on it gives you kind of this muscle memory so that even though you're being thrown some random question later, you can just pick up and you can just get, you, you can just get used to expounding on it. It kind of sounds like that's the way you think of preparation as well, because you can't possibly prepare for every possible question somebody's gonna ask you. No, but you you start by by preparing for certain things like talking mm -hmm. to somebody in line. You you don't you, you yes know, doesn't take weeks of preparation. Right. You just look at them and say what's interesting about them, what's unique about them that I that they or maybe they're not aware of that I could just say you know that color looks great on you. Yeah, um, just that's the that's you just think about it and then say it. But mm -hmm. here's what preparation does. This is what your friend is talking about preparation lays the foundation for spontaneity yes because right. you are you have what you could say or and you have like your, your go-to thing when i meet somebody i'm going to probably say what's the most interesting thing that's happened to you in the past couple months because mm -hmm. now we're off and running um because unless and if and if they say nothing then i say wow let's go back farther <laughs> and, and see uh because that's you should have more interesting stuff happening right and, and away we go from there but i may walk up and see them and they and they've got these crystal blue eyes and i have to comment on it uh -huh. and and that but then you know you move on you you move on to just asking them more about themselves mm -hmm. uh and so that the preparation is also the life skills, learning how to make somebody feel like the most important person in the room, mm -hmm. which I, I go into detail on how to do that in a book. But a lot of it is just focusing on that person and that person alone and actively listening to that person. Yep. Not looking around to see who else might be interesting to talk to or not being <laughs> able to. If you can't make eye contact, that's what you got to work on. Yes. Right. If, if uh, you know, if you don't, if you shake hands like you're handing somebody a wet oh, fish, you're going to fix that. Yes. Okay. So, <laughs> um, 
if, if, if whenever you're listening to somebody, all you're doing is thinking about what you're going to say, partly because you're nervous or partly because you have an agenda or partly because you just don't have the social skills to pay attention to somebody, then you need to develop that. You need to develop that skill of listening without planning your response. Yeah. And that's so this preparation is developing all of these life skills, but then also just preparing what you might say or what you want to do. And what happens is the more, more prepared you are for certain things, the more spontaneous you can be in all sorts of situations, because mm -hmm. you just, you're building this, this repertoire of things to say, but also just this comfort yeah. of, you know, like, I don't need to be prepared. Now, I did improv comedy for about four years. I studied yeah. it in, in Los Angeles. And when you go on stage, when you learn to go on stage with no material and can take an audience suggestion and create a scene with three other people's, public speaking is easy after that. Yeah. Because you have something to prepare. But when you do that improv, you suddenly realize how to just trust your brain. Mm -hmm. and then that stuff will come because you have a you're energized but deep down inside you're in a relaxed state but you also practice in advance how to read cues how to pick up from one thing and change it and toss it to somebody else or you practice all of those skills so even though you are practicing the exact words you have a you have a format you have a process which is very much like what you described with yeah. having a standard set of questions that you ask at the coffee shop yeah. And, and, and also, and, and a format, which is, you know, like saying yes. And in improv, it's oh, yes. you're always adding, adding something in a positive way, do the same thing in any conversation because uh -huh. people dead end conversations all the time mm -hmm. with some negative comment. Yeah. Uh, people say, wow, it's a great day. But, and they'll say, yeah, but it's supposed to rain tomorrow. Right. It's like, okay, thanks. <laughs> you know, where do you go from there it's like right. uh you know uh and and, and they, that's how they they've learned their mom talked to everybody like that and that's how they learn to talk to people mm -hmm. which is not helpful right no. so we have to relearn or unlearn these social skills mm -hmm. and then and then you got to learn to just relax you got to learn to breathe and shake off the stress in your body if you're tensing up it shows but all you have to do is is shake it off and we we deprive ourselves of oxygen a lot of times when we get anxious when you start to take control of your state it shifts and you say oh wow i can actually relax myself a little bit here and that yeah. relaxes you more the, mm -hmm. the taking control is more relaxing mm -hmm. and that a lot and, and, and your brain works better because when you're anxious your memory goes, your tongue gets tied, you, you know, you, you, you say the wrong thing, you, you're not focused on, on how to just connect like a normal person. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So we have prepare, relax. I believe we're on to I. Insights, key insights. insights about human interaction and being bold is the first thing about human interaction is people are not thinking about you anywhere near as much as you think they are right they're thinking about themselves yeah. they they they'll think about you for 10 20 seconds and then they'll go back to themselves yeah. and you'll have said something stupid and you'll be embarrassed about it 20 years later when you think yes yes absolutely i could name some things on the top of my head yeah and <laughs> if you talk to the other person they would say who was there you'd say remember that and they'd say I, I, not. are you sure it was me because yeah. i don't remember it at all yeah. Uh, but you you're still carrying it around mm -hmm. um, and you can cringe every time you play the video in your head. Yep. Um, so let that go. Realize that people that we're doing it too. We're walking around having judgments about all sorts of people. That person should never dress like that. That guy drives like an idiot. We, we have all of this stuff, but it's not accurate. We just do it. And people are doing it about us. And bold people know it's not accurate. So mm -hmm. they say other people's opinions of me are none of my business. It's, a, yeah. it's an amazing mindset shift to let go of other people's judgment of you, except for those people that really matter. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and that's your friends, your family, your mentors, your coworkers, maybe your audience at that moment. Yeah. And, and the other insight that bold people really know is that 90% of the time, nothing bad happens. 
Yes. Un unless you label it that way. And I'll give you an extreme example. There's a, a friend of mine, she was, she was speaking in front of this crowd, a few hundred people. She's 10 minutes into her, her presentation and she breaks a high heel on the stage, you know, on those, those, those sections that are, it hooks, snaps the heel right off. Now the women in the audience are gasping, like when they see this, like horrified that like this is happening to a woman, they would, you know, they would die if it happened to them. She stops, she looks down, she kicks off her shoes and says, well, I guess I need to spend more than $30 on shoes from now on uh -huh. and delivers the rest of the talk barefoot. Yeah. And that she owns them at this point because this potentially ab embarrassing, humiliating moment, she decided not to label that way. Yeah. She just made it funny. Yeah. And, and so you, it's a choice to be embarrassed. It's a choice to be humiliated. It's a choice to, to feel like everybody's laughing at you. It's a choice to make that bad. So what if everybody's laughing at you? Maybe it was pretty funny, you know, uh, laugh along with them. Yeah. Uh, and, and so bold people, they don't let anybody stop them. They're never, I, I, it, or they, somebody has to stop them because they're not stopping themselves. Mm -hmm. And they don't worry about other, other people's opinions. And they never label anything as bad. No matter what, yeah. biggest failure is just, for them, it's just information. It's just a step up. Yeah. Yeah. That's really important for entrepreneurs because most entrepreneurs fail at some point. It's, it's, it's almost an inevitable part of the process. And if you brand it as a failure, it's very hard to pick yourself back up again, as opposed to branding it as a learning opportunity and just the next step in, on your journey. Yeah. You don't have to label it as I, I, I'm an idiot for doing failure. it. I am a failure. Yep. Right. No, that was, that didn't work at all. What, yep. I wonder why not, <laughs> you yep. know, how could it have worked? What else could I have done? Take, take a, a few minutes to have an emotional reaction of course. and then move on. Yeah. Right. You can go, ah, that was horrible that that happened. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now what? Everyone's going to think I'm a failure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, uh, but because, oh, because we all think, we all want to be perfect in everybody everybody's eyes and none of us is perfect it's a ridiculous right. thing we're all deeply flawed human beings bumbling through life yeah and and so stop pretending that's what bold people say like i'm th there's a humility to being bold because you're not pretending to be somebody else you're just trying to bring yourself to the to the world and get better all the time by being vulnerable to failure and mm -hmm. and open to it and open to criticism and feedback the, they, the people say oh you know there's confident people they're just narcissists no there's nobody more insecure than a narcissist exactly yep yeah that is that okay. is what narcissism is is i can't be wrong about anything i have to be the smartest person the you know the most interesting the most successful and and they're just a walking imposter Mm -hmm. And they know it and they're, and they're dying inside unless they can fake it with everybody. Yeah. So boldness has a constant level of, of humility because you know how much more you can be. All right. Now, so D. D is dosage. Control oh. the intensity of the experience. If you're trying to build your boldness muscle, you don't do quantum leaps with it you say okay i'm going to start to talk to people in starbucks if you can't mm -hmm. talk to people yet then you need to start saying hi to people if you can't say hi to people you need to start smiling at people you need mm -hmm. to find your beginning point and then work your way up if you want to be a good public speaker you don't book yourself in a room with five thousand people somehow you're gonna die an unholy death on that stage because mm -hmm. you'll barely get a sentence out no, you go to Toastmasters with an incredibly supportive group of people and you learn to get better and, yeah. and you, you test it out and you, you do stuff where it doesn't matter. You go do an open mic night and suck, right? And, yeah. and it doesn't matter because they're on to the next comedian. They won't remember anything you said if you were funny or if you weren't, yep. but you just go, okay, I didn't. I did that. I didn't die. It was, uh, I was, I wasn't particularly funny. I wonder how I could be funnier, but mm -hmm. I did it. 
yep. I tried it. And that's when you start to try this stuff that, that th there is no danger. We, we're, you know, there's stop being fearless of what's actually harmless and try these things. And, and, and my book is full of exercises that you can do that start very simply and work up to some really crazy stuff. Yeah. It's all tiered. It's all gradual so yeah. that you're expanding your comfort zone. You're controlling the dosage as you build your, just like if you were working out, you wouldn't start mm -hmm. bench pressing 300 pounds. Right. It's going to fall on your neck and behead you basically. Yeah. The bar, In so. education, it's called scaffolding, literally building on top of what you've already learned. Yeah. Bit yeah. Bit. Yeah. And, and it's accretive. It's, yes. you know, it's, it, it, that's, you know, like math. It's like, when you understand this level, you, you can do the next level, but you, you got to have good social skills before you start meeting people. You, mm -hmm. you got to have good stage skills before you get on stage and think, Oh, I can just do it. I've got a really great PowerPoint now. Right. So, uh, and, and then the final E in pride is everyday action. Um, make a bold move every day and this is a life skill anything yes. you want to get better at nibble at it every day yes. somehow mm -hmm. make it a habit yep because that because then you don't have to decide whether you're going to do it or not you say yeah. i got to make a bold move every day and and you you say i'm going to talk to a stranger every day and then you set it higher and you higher and higher and you and and you at a certain point you can't go to bed you go like oh my god i didn't talk to a stranger and you get dressed and you go back, go into a, a drugstore and just talk to a stranger. <laughs> no, you, know? you do not. You do not. <laughs> <laughs> you do not get out of bed to go to a drugstore and talk to a stranger. <laughs> Sometimes you have to, if you haven't done it. If you, but, and, and the thing about it is when you do it every day, your brain says, oh, this is who I am. I am. If you are a dilettante, if you're a dabbler or a weekend warrior, your brain says that's who you are. Yeah. You know, if you play guitar when you feel like it, your brain doesn't say you're a guitar player. It says you're a dabbler. If you play an instrument every day, your brain says you play guitar. And yeah. what happens with anything that you do every day is your brain is working in the background on it. If you're writing a book, write a sentence or two at least every day because your brain, the, the 80 or 90 percent of what your brain is doing is unconscious, mm -hmm. which is why we think of stuff in the shower. Yeah, uh, is because the brains, we, we threw stuff into the washing machine and let it tumble. Uh, and, and the brain will work on it. And, and so that's why with, with your boldness, you'll, you'll become that it will become your default mode, because your brain says, I guess we're going to step up, I guess we're going to speak up here. And this is this goes all the way to neuroscience is when you start acting boldly, your cautious, hesitant neural pathways will atrophy. Scientifically, this is what happens to the neural pathways when we disabuse ourselves of, of their, their need in our life. Mm -hmm. And the more times we're bold, the more the brain widens those pathways so that we do become more spontaneous. We do become more creative in all of these situations. We do become mm -hmm. more comfortable. It says we don't need to be comfortable, uncomfortable. We're used to this. Yeah. You're working that muscle. Yeah. Fred, this has been so enlightening and absolutely amazing. The book is called Super Bold, and I assume people can get it in all of the regular places one gets a book. <laughs> Yes, uh, Amazon, it's in Audible and Kindle and hardcover, and it's me reading it. So it'll sound a lot like it does right now. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and my website is uh, fredjoyle.com. And so I'm Fred Joyle everything, you know, LinkedIn, Facebook, I'm a marketing guy, I grab my name yeah, immediately. Exactly. Anyway. J-O-Y-A-L. Yep. Yep. And, uh, and you can download the first chapter of the book on my website. And I'm also doing a two day super bold workshop uh, in uh, Los Angeles, June 24th and 25th. I'll eventually do them around the country, but this is the inaugural one. And I'm really excited about doing it. I'm gonna put, it's gonna be a really safe place for people to be really uncomfortable. Well, that's a wrap. If you enjoyed this episode of Marketing Made Easy, please subscribe to Jotful's YouTube channel. That's J-O-T-T-F-U-L. That way, you'll never miss an episode. We'll meet you on the next one.